Hello, one and all, and welcome to episode 203 of Love at First Scent with me, Percy Lays, as always, now coming to you live from YouTube. And this is another interview episode, similar to what we had last week. We're going through a little bit of an interview phase. We've got another one lined up for next Wednesday as well, but I'm not revealing the identity of the interviewee yet. Who have we got in the hot seat today? Well, I think we've got a really, really interesting and pleasant chat ahead of us because one of the many, many... Um, character attributes that this person possesses is the fact that he's very, very chatty and very easy to get along with and very easy to talk to and very articulate. So for sure, we've got a, a fun chat ahead of us, but, but more to the point, he is one of the co-founders and one of the creative directors behind this brand here called Ostends, which emerged a few years ago but in a very unusual way, not in the kind of conventional way. And I think that's uh, what we will talk about, because, for instance, you can't, you or at least at the time, you couldn't buy any Ostens fragrances in any other shops at any other retailers. You had to go to their website or you had to go to their pop-up shop in London. Um, there are lots and lots of layers to the concept behind the brand, uh, lots to talk about, lots to explore. And the, 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 this co-founder, who I'm about to introduce you to, actually started uh, the, uh, the brand from a fairly unique position because he came uh, from having had a great deal of experience in the perfume industry, uh, not just on the retail side, but on the distribution side, on the marketing side, on the PR side, to some extent on the creation side. And it was as this fully formed perfume person that he decided to create this brand. So, without further ado, please welcome to the Persele Studio, Christopher Yu, or Chris Yu of Ostend. Thanks for joining us, Chris. How are you doing today? I, I'm nervous now that you've given me an intro like that because am I, how am I supposed to live up to all those lies? <laughs> it's gonna be, I have to be chatty. I can't be nervous anymore. No, but I'm really excited because this is my very, very first YouTube live. So I'm so pleased it's with you, a good friend and someone that I'm just can't wait to have a chat with. I can't believe for one second that you are nervous. But anyway, I can assure you that the people who watch are always very, very friendly and very knowledgeable. That's the only bit where you may need to feel a little bit of pressure. Um, and I should say, I didn't ask you in our little pre-chat, are you in London at the moment? Because I always like saying, you know, live from yeah, I, I'm live from London here in <laughs> right. Austin's showroom here in Central London. In, in Fantastic. Marble. Fantastic. Right. Um, thank you to everybody for tuning in. And I should also say, this is going to sound a little, you know, very, very different from anything I've said before, but stay tuned to find out some details about how you can um, grab yourself a complimentary Ostens sample. And that is only going to be for people watching live. So stick around and you'll get some details about that. I'm sure a lot of you out there will have uh, questions for Chris. As always, just kind of hang on to them and then there will come a point in the broadcast where I will say, okay, go with your questions. But for now, it's also really nice taking hellos from around the world. So let's see where people are saying they are. The very first one that we had was a 2 z in one saying, hello, Persilase peeps. Nice and cool this morning in the west coast of the US. So west coast is in the house. We have got Eco Jock saying hi from Canada, which is fantastic. And also Anna saying hello, Christopher, from Toronto in Canada. Um, Icarus Midair says hello from Romania. And I'm sure I saw one from further east. There we go. Gino saying good evening from Singapore. And... Ash from the Miss Tantrum blog says, hello, Chris, so lovely to see you live. I don't know whether this is somebody you know, but anyway, welcome to all of you. Thanks for tuning in. Right. I have a feeling that this is going to be quite a kind of perfume geek-tastic conversation, <laughs> for which we make no apologies. And I know that you are uh, a self-confessed, unashamed perfume geek, and that you have got quite a sizable collection of vintage, vintagey perfume. So I want to start by asking you, what was the last truly amazing vintage scent that you added to your collection? Oh, this this is really hard. You start with the hardest question. It's like choosing your favorite child. I mean, who can do that? No, but um, I did say the last one. I didn't say your favorite one. I'm just saying. Yeah, but you don't know how many I buy. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> okay. 
Um, I, I have, if anyone's seen the Austin's Instagram, I, I came out of the closet and showed my collection today um, online, and I have over 10,000 bottles uh, on a wall that will, I swear one day we'll just pull the whole building down. Okay, 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 hang on, hang on. You said 10,000? Plus, yeah, that's the, that's the rounding down. When was the last time you counted? Have you got some sort of a database? Is it all catalogued? Uh, well, when we moved in uh, for insurance purposes, they made me like catalog part of that, but I kind of gave up um, and I can't bear to, to give that task to, to an intern or someone and punish them with it. So it's my job, which I've gotten lazy about. But the last vintage fragrance that I, actually two, they came from the same seller on eBay. One was the original Donna Karen Chaos in okay. the, the star sort of lightning jar uh, bottle. And the second one was a, um, what was kind of, it's almost empty, but a parfum extract version of Voldemort by Diana. What, quite an old bottle? Pretty, very old. Gosh, is this is this a sort of very serious pastime, scouring the net for vintage bottles? It's, it's less vintage. It's just things that I have read. You know, I read all the blogs. So I'm like you guys. I read, I read, I follow you religiously, which is why this is such a treat. And when you reference something, I think it was, I think I have to blame you for Voldemort, actually. Did you, I think you mentioned it in a video um, from maybe six months ago. It's and, very possible. Yeah, and... They have obviously reformulated it, we assume. And I've only ever smelt the eau de toilette in the sort of bee spray bottle. Um, and I just wanted to see if the parfum was as amazing as I think you mentioned. Um, and it had really turned in the bottle, but you know, I still felt like it was a bit of a, the, the thing with perfume for me, is sometimes it's quite a time machine. Like I, I obviously wasn't alive <laughs> at the turn of the set in 1908 or whenever uh, Vol de Nuit came out in 1918. Um, and I I just, when you smell, when you pull that stopper, you can just, I feel like you can totally end up in a different time and place. And so I love that about fragrance. And and that's any fragrance. I'm, I'm not a snob in my collection. I was just showing someone today. I was pointing out quite proudly the original Kim Kardashian and the very first J-Lo Glow. Um, <laughs> okay, one. bye, Chris. Thanks very much for the interview. <laughs> I didn't say I wear them, but no, okay. they end up on the shelf. No, but that's fine. I've, I've got to share these two comments, actually, because Daniel is saying, hello from Andover, was watching Wimbledon, but I had to get my priorities oh, straight. Absolutely. Absolutely. Back to the tennis, it's way more important. <laughs> <laughs> and Woozy here saying, I wonder how much perfume related debt can be attributed to Persolase. If only I was on some sort of commission, <laughs> life would might look very, very different. But anyway, okay, no, we, we could we could probably talk about vintage scents for hours, but Absolutely. that's not what we're here for. And and I fear that there is going to be far too much to pack into this one hour or however long it is that, that we end up chatting. We, we we never go over an hour. And so we may have to have you back for a part two and a part three because because you have done so much in the industry. And as I said, you were, for example, um, uh, very, very, very heavily involved in the fact that Diptyque is now such a massive brand in the UK. And you've helped uh, create the perfumes that, uh, correct me if I, any of these are wrong, by the way, but you know, the Fornacetti perfumes, the Sia Trudon perfumes, uh, you've worked uh, with lots and lots of brands in lots of different capacities. But what was the point, do you think, when you and the brand's co-founder, Laurent Delafon, what was the point where you kind of thought, you know what, we need to do our own thing now? Yeah, it's, it's quite an um, interesting story because everyone asks us, you know, when they meet us, why did you start the brand? And it's so much of it came out of being around amazing perfumers and amazing raw material supplies. So the, the very first, Genesis moment for Austin's really came about from a visit that uh, Laurent and I took to Grass uh, about five years ago. Yeah, five years ago, 2015, um, six years ago. And it was my, funnily enough, it was my first trip there, even after 15 years at that point in the industry, it was my first trip to Grass. And we met with an amazingly kind, generous man called Bertrand de Pavy, who's the head of LMR, Laboratoire Monique Remy, which is the raw material supplier to IFF. 
Um, and it changed the way I s smell. Like, like I thought I knew, I, I kind of went down there with a bit of chip on my shoulder. Like I've been in the industry long enough. I know what I'm doing. And it was so humbling and inspiring to sit in front of these raw materials and smell something that challenged everything that has packed into like, I'll tell you what it was. It, it, no, lie, this is uh, rose oil from Asparta. That was the very first thing that I smelt down there. After telling Bertrand I didn't want to smell any roses because I hated roses. <laughs> so being a very humorous Frenchman, he sort of handed me a muette, uh, a blotter, and it's like, it, what, what do you think? And I was like, this is amazing. And this rose oil from Asparta is 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 jammy and and like lychee, Turkish delight. It, it wasn't like the granny rose that I had really had a lot of some bad attitude, you know, about. And at that point, I was like, right, if I got it wrong, and I've worked in this industry for this long, then surely we've all kind of got it wrong because we've been sold something. So, you know, I grew up with roses that were in, like my grandma, who's today still with me, I'm very grateful, 95 years old. She uses like talcum powder with rosin and Laura Ashley type soaps that are 30 years old. I'm like, please use those, grandma, um, that someone's gifted her. And so there's a more of a toiletries feel to the rose. So I really grew yeah. up with a very bad experience of rose. And even though I love the smell of the flowers in nature, my mom's a florist and I grew up around a ton of flowers, every day, it wasn't until that I smelled this extract, it was like, I get why the perfumers keep coming back to this. And coming to Paris, to Grasse, I was lucky enough to sit down and I was um, Dominic Ropion, uh, so you know, name drop, but Dominic is, I believe, the master of the modern rose. I mean, his portrait of a lady, you know, love or hate is, is a technical masterpiece when it comes to rose. and he, I said to him, oh, Dominic, I've just been to grass and this rose is amazing. And he's like, yes, sir, of course, Chris, as if I'm like, duh. And, and, and I said, well, why don't you use it more? And he's like, well, we can't afford to. And I said, what do you mean? And it's like, well, brands, the brands that he was working on, um, they wouldn't allow over a certain budget. And these naturals by LMR, for a reason, the reason the quality is this, because they pay fair trade, they're sustainable, they invest in the farming technology. It's expensive to grow. It's like organic um, seasonal vegetables at your farmer's market. They're, they're considerably more expensive than in a supermarket that's imported and cold stored. So he said, you know, I, I can't use them the way I want to. And I, I just throw away comment. I said, well, what would you do if you were allowed to? And again, Dominique, he's quite quiet. And then he's just sort of the smile started on the left sort of lip. And he said, you're coming back in a month, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah. And it's like, I'll show you. I was like, oh, that's exciting. So a month passes, Laurent and I go back on a Fornacetic project and Dominic, we walk past Dominic's office in, in IFF in Nui and near Paris and he's like, come in, come in, come in. So we sit down and he takes his blotters out and sprays and he passes it to me. And I'm like, this is, what is this? This is witchcraft. And I was smelling this voluptuous, dense, genderless rose, which he had told me he'd put four types of natural rose, um, of which were all at IFRA maximums. So I'm like, while, oh. while you're talking, actually, I'm going to spray some of your impression yes. rose oil esparta, because I would I'd imagine that this it, it ended up as, as what we've now got. And, and that's where, it, and even then it wasn't a brand because Dominic was like, you can't have the formula. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, I'm not, I'm not gonna bankrupt your business by giving you this formula. I was like, how expensive is it? He wouldn't tell me. And we were coming back again in, in, in a month after that. And he said, well, when you come back, I'm gonna do you four mods that are a bit, bit more affordable and maybe you can use it in one of your brands. And I was thinking for another brand at that time. So we came back, of course, we do a blind test, long story short, what do Laurent and I both pick blind is the original formula. So we were like, we had that. And so at that so, point, would it, so would it be fair to say that then you kind of went on, on a mission of showcasing and championing specific materials that you kind of thought, okay, well, we need to be the guys who 
really, really bring the materials back into the spotlight. Exactly. And that was where, it's, okay, if, imagine if you had the world's best ingredients, which we did at our, you know, at our doorstep and grass and, and gave them to the most talented perfumers that I knew of at the time um, and told them just go for it. No brief, carte blanche, create what's the perfume formula that's in your heart, you know, the one that you've been wanting to do. So I, I, I wouldn't be uh, forgiven if I didn't at least ask you this. In what kind of ballpark, at least tell us, is the, <laughs> is the formula cost-wise for... Uh, you've okay, got to give so us some idea. <laughs> I, don't want to, I don't want this to turn into like a QVC because I want to spend time on the nerdy stuff. But our Austin's Impression Rose Oil Esparta 50 mil is, retails at 175. And that's for the 50 mil and we gift you the oil so you can see where the inspiration came from. If you had to go into the wholesale, you know, if I sold it at Selfridges or Harrods or, uh, you know, Holt Renfrew or whatever, it, it would be, you know, 400 pounds upwards for a 50 mil. And it just, it broke my heart to people to pay that much access to thing that I had fallen in love with. So that's why it's sold only on austins.com and here in the showroom in London, because we just couldn't afford to put it through that wholesale model and there's no disrespect to the amazing job that Harrods and Selfridge do it's just we don't have the ability to do that with these formulas because they are far too expensive but that, as, you've mentioned, as you've mentioned the showroom a couple of times I actually should uh, ask you to say where it is because I, I've, got, I've got to be honest with you I didn't even realize there was a showroom at the moment so so where is it so it's in Marlborough, so um, just off Oxford Street near the Marble Arch. And um, if you go on our website, you can make an appointment. I'm always here, so I take all the appointments. So if you want to come in and talk perfume with me, um, I'd love that because it gets me away from the day job. <laughs> talk perfume well, for hours. Look, I wasn't I wasn't going to do this until a little bit later, but I think we've come to a sort of natural point where I can mention this because uh, uh, the, those of you watching and only those of you watching live, OK, um, Ostans have very, very kindly offered you an opportunity to grab yourselves a complimentary sample. So if you look at that ticker tape going down the bottom, if you go to ostans.com slash sample, um, I think you just have to fill in some details and you can get a free Austin sample. Um, Chris, could you just tell us whether this is worldwide or? Um, and unfortunately it's UK only. However, okay. please, if you, as I've seen now that everyone's tuning in from all over the world, leave your details. We are launching, the only reason I'll tell you why is that distributing, shipping alcohol is is near impossible with the laws. So we're setting up a North American distribution, European distribution in the next few months. So once I have your details, I will send that out, I promise. It just won't be this week, um, but we'll keep in touch. Um, but I'm sorry, it is limited immediately to the UK for today, but leave us your details and I promise you we will, once we enter your territory, um, make sure that you are the first to receive. And you can choose whatever sample too. So. Um, it's the only way you can get to us and we can get to you. So I'm sorry today it's only UK, but- That's uh, great, thank you. So some, something something new uh, for the Persolais YouTube channel. So let us know what you think of it. And also I must stress that that link will be active only for an hour after the conclusion of this broadcast. So if you're watching the recording, please don't go to that link. I feel like I'm on Children's BBC or something saying, you know, the, the, Eurovision. The, 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 no, the, the Eurovision, yes, the lines are closed. The rhymes are, lines are closed. We'll leave that up there for a bit. Okay, we ought to get another obvious, questions out, uh, obvious question out of the way as well. The name, what does it mean? Where do, how did you come up with it? Uh, Austin's is a made up name, um, but it comes from the Latin Ostende. Now Laurent normally answers this because he studied Latin. Um, and Ostende means to elevate, so to show. So we love that idea that it's about showing the raw materials in the natural. So um, that's how the name came about. And the Ostende, was, we came across it because Laurent studied good old French education. He studied a poem by Baudelaire called Fleur du Mal, which mentions an ostensoir, I think it is, which is, um, but anyway, that's where the name comes from, made up. Brilliant. I want to go back to talking about, you know, the, 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 all of the levels and the details in, in the brand, because um, 
I, I I use the word detailed and layered, but but I think you you won't mind my saying that some people would say we would might use the word fussy about the brand. So correct me if I get any of this wrong, but you get f for each of the releases there is uh, what we would call a fine fine fragrance, which you have called impression something something. So it's impression rose oil asparta or impression patchouli heart number one, impression patchouli heart number two. Each of the scents has got a corresponding oil, which you call an preparation, and it's preparation, a, and it's just a single ingredient in there, which right. is the perfumer and me. Each each perfume has got its own kind of color code. Uh, for each perfume, you have stated and revealed the identity of the perfumer. Uh, as I say, you decided not to do actual shops. You've explained yourself uh, all of that. And also one very, very unusual detail in that on the bottles, um, I don't know if people will be able to see this, but you'd probably be able to see it online, but you have actually specified the fraction of the overall uh, composition that is the material in question. So for instance, impression rose oil is sparta from IFFLMR, and then you say that the rose oil is one over 154 parts, so one part out of 154. Did you not worry that you were putting too many things into this mix and creating this like potential geek explosion that would actually confuse people? Absolutely, and, and it is confusing, and I've realized that. And you know what, I think I've worked for 17, 18 years on other people's brands, so, I kind of got to hide behind amazing people like Francis Kirjian. We helped launch his brand here in the UK, who is one, I still think, one of the world's most talented perfumers alive um, and a great character. And, you know, we worked with Datik and, and the original founders before they passed on. Um, and when I walked into, okay, we're going to do our own brand, Laurent and I, I know this sounds like such a sob story from X Factor, but we were pretty scared to put ourselves out there. So the real reason why there's so much to it is because we I really felt like I had to justify these fragrances. So I layered all of this stuff on it. When in actual fact, I just realized that the, the scent is enough. The perfume, you feel it or you don't. And that's what I've realized now with it. But I love that we've put the transparency issue, you know, thing there and we've, we've told you, you know, who the perfumer is. And because if you're interested in that, then all that detail's there. But ultimately, all you need to do is smell it and love it, as we all know. And that's why I'm not a snob when it comes to the brand. And, you know, I, I, things will surprise me. Like, you know, if anyone always says, oh, what fragrance should I buy for my son and this is my budget. I'm like, David Beckham's first fragrance is a quality piece of work and it's nine pounds from Superdrug, so go buy it from him and see what, what he thinks. So if there's a nice, if there's a smell that I connect with it, it really doesn't matter. So I think Austin's may seem complicated. Um, the most complex part is that we're the first brand ever to give you what the perfumers use. So the raw material comes as a gift with the 50 mil that you can, have the same experience as Donald and I did when we first went to grass and re smelled these, the rose in particular, or the cedarwood, or jasmine, or patchouli for the first time. Um, I think there's nothing ever is going to replace that moment. I liken it to food, you know, like we've all got that memory of the first time trying sushi, or for me, it was the first time having baking that was made with a vanilla pod rather than in New Zealand growing up there where I'm from in the 70s you couldn't get it so people use vanilla essence which is just like flavoring so the first time i came here and i was like why is this sponge or whatever it's something very simple why does it taste amazing and my friend was like um you know vanilla pod and it's like show me the pod and then suddenly i realized what things should have tasted like or like the first time you go to a, a restaurant uh, like a, some sort of ethnic cuisine, like Chinese food, when you go to Hong Kong, go to Vancouver, or and you're like, that's what it should taste like. Um, that, I think that's what it's like for us with Austin's. It's like when you smell these raw materials, you you just respond viscerally to them. Which of these, which of these many many layers do you find, you know, being sort of brutally honest, do you find that consumers are actually the least interested in? Because I'm, you know, the, the likes of you and I 
and probably most of the people watching would think, oh, Dominique Gropion, oh, Alexi Dadia, whatever. But do people, are most people out there care about the perfumers, really? It's funny you mentioned that. Um, to a man on the street, a woman on the street, that, uh, that it's all about the smell and the raw material. Like, tell me why this raw material is so high quality. And then they stop. It's us perfume geeks, nerds. Like I follow, I followed Jean Claude Elena's career and Olivia Giacobetti's career. I would buy everything they made. I think that's only us that would do that, and I kind of love that. So there's enough for us geeks, and then for everyone else, they can take whatever pathway they want into the brand. And Woozy up here, I just need to find the question, ask a question that I kind of basically wanted to touch on for your um, Jasmine scent i'm just trying to find the image here you've actually stated very very transparently that the jasmine oil is one over 2777 parts jasmine so woozy's question here is that makes me wonder how much is used in the industry have you had people saying to you oh my word you know you, you're taking the mick here one out of more than 2000 you know almost 3000 parts that's nothing you know what do you say to them Jasmine in particular is a good one because Jasmine, there's IFRA rules on Jasmine and they keep reducing the amount of Jasmine we can use every year. And luckily Jasmine is so, especially the, the Jasmine Absolute that we use from Egypt, you can use a tiny, 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 tiny amount and you can smell it immediately. So, so Jasmine, you don't need a lot as in certainly compared to rose, which here there's 4% of rose oil asparta and the jasmine, it's 0.7. Um, so it's much less. But I'm going to be very careful using my words here. Um, I want to encourage people to be curious about raw materials and the quality of them and what's actually used in the fragrances that they love. And so I, I hope that everyone starts to think about what's inside their fragrances. What it means about the industry, I think you can all make assumptions. Um, and I, I don't want it to be negative. I think there's room for everybody and there's room for everything. And, you know, I, I can love a fragrance if there's, you know, nothing that the top note, middle note, base notes that are listed is actually in there, but I can still feel it, you know, and, and I think it's important that it, it does, it, it is very difficult sometimes to unpack the, the smoke and mirrors that the industry is kind of self-perpetuated and I just don't feel it's necessary because I think the reality is more beautiful than the myth. So see- were you, were, you also, were you also not a part of that to some extent in your pre-Austin days? Or absolutely, absolutely. And while these brands that we worked with weren't mine, so I couldn't do what, what I wanted. Part of creating Austin's was this, dare I say, frustration that I wanted to do what I believed in. And whether you believe it or not, doesn't matter, just smell it if you love it, wear it. But I really wanted to sort of show that the, like Tony Grimmie did, you know, if you have a great quality ingredient, it's like cooking, it just changes what you, what it tastes like. Um, you know, seasonal white asparagus that we only get for like two weeks. You know, when you taste it and it's just a simple bit of oil or you know, vinaigrette on it, it's delicious, but you can put it into, you know, a very complex soup or, you know, it, and it's just as beautiful, but you've got to start with great raw materials. I think that's anything, whether it's music, or it all comes back to instruments or raw materials or, yeah, that's my belief anyway. And am I right that you still work with other brands in the other role yes. that you... <clears throat> so w was there any consternation from them? You know, was there ever a moment where they said, well, hang on, hang on, hang on, you can't be kind of muscling in on this territory. You're supposed to be giving all your time to us. H how do you negotiate all of that? The, the, the great thing I love sharing with people is that actually the fragrance industry is really small and we all know each other um, and everyone is super supportive of each other. When we were launching our brand, I remember having a dinner with Roger Dove um, and I said sheepishly, here's my 
sample set. I'm just launching this. I just wanted to share it with you. And he was so pleased for me. He's been so supportive, telling everyone about what we've done. Uh, Francis Kerjean has been super supportive. Um, the, the guys at Dictique I'm still friends with and talk all the time. Uh, you know, the Trudon team helped us with, with, you know, looking at potentially doing candles. And, you know, like everyone actually wants you to succeed, especially because I guess we've been in it for a while. So it's the first time we're putting our head above the parapet um, per se. So hopefully at this stage it continues, but um, I'm very grateful. I love being in the fragrance industry. I feel it's such a blessing because I fell into it. Um, and then I realized it's my absolute, fills my heart and I would do this job for free. You know, like I would have- Have you, have you, seen, have you seen any of them pinching your ideas? <laughs> I think <laughs> ideas are meant to be shared. And the more- <laughs> Very good. The, the more that, they do, look at, look at, you know, I think it was, Correct me if I'm wrong, you guys viewing will know. I think Giorgio Armani did the first oat perfumery collection in a mainstream brand with his Armani Privé. And then Chanel followed and then Dior followed. And then I think now even Hugo Boss does this Les Exclusives thing. So, you know, it's not an original idea anymore. But ultimately what it does is it creates more interest and there's people, the fragrance nerds of we get more to play with so if we get more surely it's better so i'm not really worried about some sort of pinching ideas because i think there's an, an endless pot when it comes to ideas now chris in a former life according to your biog you're actually a solicitor trained solicitor yeah um, for my sins yeah which which means you know and you, you can cover your ears for this that that, that, that you've got to be very very sharp do you find that your <laughs> Diplomat, you know, because you've, you've mostly given very diplomatic answers to a lot of these questions. Do you find that, you know, a, a bit of diplomacy goes a long way in the perfume industry? Maybe that's why I've had such a long career in the fragrance industry, because I've never offended anyone yet. Look, I, I honestly believe everything I've just said about the industry. I'm so passionate about it. And I think sometimes that, the, and you can, I, I think a lot of it has to do with I'm a New Zealander, so everyone's like, oh, little Kiwi orcs, you know, um, and they're not, threatened. they're not threatened by the accent. I truly believe that. I've, I've thickened up my Kiwi accent. Um, but it's not so much the, the law side, because trust me, when I used to be a lawyer and I'd sit at a dinner party next to someone, they would literally turn their back. They don't want to talk to the lawyer. But now when I sit down and I meet new people, I'm like, what do you do? I work in fragrance. They're like, smell me. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's, there's so many facets to the industry. And of course, like any industry, there's dark sides, but I'm very lucky in that I've never really experienced that. Um, so I hope that continues. Wonderful. I should now say we're almost, we're kind of like at the half hour mark that you're watching episode 203 of Love at First Scent with me, Persilaise. And in our interview hot seat today, we have got Christopher Yu, one of the co-founders of Austin's and one of the creative directors as well. Start sending some of your questions for Chris in. And it's always nice to know where you're watching from. But while we're waiting for some questions to come through, we should do some more smelling. And I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about this one, which was my favorite from your range from day one and is still my favorite. This is the impression Cedarwood Heart. Um, just tell us a little bit about how this one came about. You know, was it early in the development of the brand or uh, tell us the story. So Cedarwood Heart was sort of the, no, the, the middle. We'd gone to IFF and we had chosen the raw materials. So we had already chosen rose, jasmine, cedarwood, patchouli and it was actually the perfumer, Alex Dadier, who said, um, Chris, I'd love to do the cedarwood fragrance. I'm like, yeah, great. No one else is like fighting for that. Like people fought over who was gonna do patchouli. But cedarwood, I think for me is such an underrated material. And in fact, it's used so much, especially a lot in women's fragrances. And I didn't realize this. Alexi told me it's used a lot in florals because cedarwood is used to if you imagine a lovely, light, sort of pretty floral, the cedarwood is like a stem or a stalk. It's used in the formula to hold it all together. So lots of like freesias and hyacinths have a lot of cedarwood in the backbone of it. So I was like immediately fascinated. And then Alexei is a very cerebral creative. He writes children's books. He's a musician. He's so talented. And he took a different approach. 
So with Rose and Dominique, Dominique wanted to really push out the Rose. With Bruno Jovanovic and Jasmine, he wanted to create uh, from a natural and imagined Jasmine, the Jasmine of our memories. And then with the cedar wood, Alexi wanted to riff on the idea of nostalgia because he smelt the cedar wood and he said, it just makes me feel. And I loved that. And so Laurent and I were like, I, I can't wait to see what you do. And so the fragrance, the eau de parfum, of course, cedar wood is like pencil shavings and wood workshop and walking in a forest. It's very linear. We all understand it. But what he's done with the eau de parfum that he created was he thought about where cedar existed in his grandfather's world. So that, you know, there's cedar wood balls next to the worsted wool jumpers that he had. He smoked, so there was a cedar wood humidor. Um, so there's, so he then put tobacco in this. Um, he was always raking leaves with this, you know, um, rake, which is wooden rake. And so there's that sort of galbanum crushed leaves feel. So it's one of the most three-dimensional holographic fragrances as if someone's entered a room and then left. Um, and I love that about this fragrance, um, especially because Alexi took that approach. And not a million miles away from Vol de Nuit, actually, with the with the green the greenness. Mm -hmm. And did you have to go through lots of mods? You know, what was it like working with him? Did he did 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 you just want to go with what he presented as the final version or there was very so there's a fragrance that took so many mods, um, and I'll tell you that later. But the cedar wood was pretty immediate. The only mods that went was for tox screening. So when you when the perfume has created a fragrance, it goes to their engineer to check all of the if rules because if is obviously always changing, and the perfumers don't necessarily keep up all the time. So then the engineer was like, "Oh, it's a little bit too much." I think it was galbanum in it can't remember exactly and then we had to modulate it slightly so that was the only mod really because we just wanted the perfumer to play um, and create whatever they wanted there's a funny story um well you've heard the one with dominic and the mods for, for the rose but the uh, impression um cashmere and velvet which is our fragrance in the collection that is um, based on an aroma chemical. So cashmere and velvet is not a natural, it's a captive aroma chemical synthetic by IFF. And cashmere and velvet smells, well, it's a, it's a move on from cashmere on, which is in everything today still, like ICE and Broxen. It's one of those notes that when someone says blonde woods or cashmere woods, it's cashmere on. So cashmere and velvet does exactly what it says on the label. It makes everything smell like you've wrapped it in cashmere or that when you rub velvet or the, you know, along your fingers, it's got that lovely fuzzy feeling. So it has a sort of a warm, fuzzy electric feeling. And Sophie Labe created a fragrance with a lot of natural, her eau de parfum has a lot of natural New Caledonian sandalwood, cedarwood from Virginia and slugs of the cashmere on velvet from IFF. And I loved the smell of it originally, but I didn't know how it was performing. And so we kept changing mods and, and it wasn't until, so I have two dogs and they're in the office with me and God help their poor nostrils because dogs smell like 20 million times stronger than us. And I'm always spraying things like, like what I'm doing now. And it fell on one of my dogs, Otto, um, the cashmere and velvet, the final mod. And I was taking the tube home and the woman next to me was like, can I pat your dog? <laughs> and after she started patting him, I could see her take her hands and sort of go, why, why is my hand smell? And then she picked, she said, can I pick him up? And she picked him up and just nuzzled herself into Otto, much to Otto's disgust. Um, and I realized at that point, she's like, your dog is the, smells like the best thing in the world. And I said, actually, I think it's perfume. She goes, please, 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 here's my email. Um, and tell me when you launch this perfume because it is the most amazing smelling thing I've ever smelled. And that was the very scientific way we um, finalized the mod. So um, please don't call the RSPCA, but we did test on animal. <laughs> now, speaking of launches, you launched a few years ago, you know, made a big splash, made a big impression, lots of people talking about you. Um, but 
but but th we haven't had anything since then. And this kind of ties in with the question that we've had from Georgie. Thanks very much. You know, what's next for Austin's? So I would say what's next for Austin's, but I would also add on to that. Why haven't we had anything since these six? Uh, it costs a lot of money to create and launch fragrance. I won't lie about that. And, you know, we wanted to focus telling the story of Austin's because it is quite complex or fussy. Um, and so we took our time with that. But also um, we've had COVID uh, and dare I say, unfortunately, Brexit. There's been a lot of issues, but we have, I am I guess I can tell you guys because you're like family because you're perfume friends. Um, <laughs> we have been developing um, candles based on the raw materials, which are amazing. I just... I know I get to say that, but I wanted to create candles because that's really where I learned my trade with Diptyque is the first brand that I worked for in fragrance. And I wanted to create the most accurate enveloping version of a rose oil esparta and the jasmine from Egypt. And so technically that's quite difficult. So the We've just, I think, two weeks ago, signed off on all the formulas for candles, so they're going to testing. They should, fingers crossed, launch in February, March next year. Yeah, that's how long it takes for testing. Gosh. And there's two other odor parfums that have been EFRA approved and tested, and we're in something called stability um, testing now. And I've always been challenged by Vetti there, as in I love it, but I've, I never have smelt anything outside. Everyone talks about on um, the blogs how the original Gallon Vetiver is like the Holy Grail. And I've never smelt that. Um, I can't find vintage bottles of it. And Osmotech where they don't have it. And so I've been told by Roger, he's done a very good Vetiver. I think you like that one, don't you? I seem to remember I did actually, yeah. yeah. And, and, and he's a huge, he's a huge fan of Gallon's original Vetiver. Yeah, and, and then there's also, um, like, Tom Ford's Grey Vetiver is not bad. Like, it's got that feel, but I don't like many other Vetiver. So we've been working with um, Julian Raskine, the perfumer, on this Vetiver, which I think we've finally gotten to a point which is just stunning, and it makes me feel like those sort of slightly vintage Vetivers. And an orange blossom, because orange blossom is so ubiquitous, certainly in the French culture, and Laurent sort of, told me that growing up, most baby products in France are awesome orange, uh, narrowly type smell, whereas in the sort of Anglo New Zealand, UK, we have baby powder, which smells of like heliotropy baby powder. So for him, it's such a nostalgic uh, sense. So, you know, we've been really playing with the idea of orange blossom and this and that sort of slightly French baby idea. Um, so that hopefully should be coming out next year in the first few months as well. So we've got and a lot of the perfumer behind that one. Um, Julia, oh God, I can never pronounce her surname and I feel terrible because she's the most hilarious woman at IFF. Juliet Krikaga, I'll put it on the... Comments. I think I know who you mean. It, it's the lady with a very, very long... It's Cara Gueslu or some, something along those lines. Yeah, I should know yeah. as well. Really, really sorry. But if you if you Google her, you'll find her. This is really bad. Sorry if, if anybody from IFF is watching. But, um, um, here's, a, here's an interesting question. I will put it to you. You you may not have much to say about it. I don't know. But I guess it touches on the business of, of marketing and promotion in the kind of modern social media world. And, and you know, here we are taking very, very much taking part in it. This is a question from regular viewer and supporter Ashfaq. He says, how do you deal with people asking for full bottles for review who have very little experience in writing or reviewing perfumes from the little that I know, it's a big problem for smaller houses. Anything to say on that? Yeah, um, Ash, uh, we get approached every week by lots of people and saying, I'd love to be sent a, a bottle of fragrance. And, you know, we're very lucky that we get to talk to a lot of perfume nerds, um, and that's myself and they with the us geeks. And so I tend to, I answer pretty much with all the emails and, and with the DMs and things as well. And it's very easy to start chatting to someone and kind of get a gauge on how, are they just hunting for free stuff? 
which you know, in every industry there is. I've been hearing about hotels, people blagging, saying that they're going to put it on Instagram um, and blagging free hotel stays and holidays. Um, the it's very easy with fragrance, certainly for, for me to figure out if you're one of us. You know, like all of us can talk the hind legs about of each other about fragrance, and so asking a few questions tends to sort of weed out some not so serious people. Um, and we get to also make friends. So a lot of you know people that I follow, and I know some of them are tuned in today. I like Miss Tantrum. Thanks for tuning in. Um, you know, I've met through you know the Austin social media. So I've loved that the community has grown for us. But yeah, it, 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 we do get a lot of approaches. But we find it quite easy to to filter out who's serious and who's not. And therefore, the ones that we do end up connecting with and sending product to, we end up having these deep conversations about fragrance that's so much fun yeah good answer thank you here's a here's a very direct question from Yura. do you like animalic notes i have always struggled with musks not because i knew what they were but because growing up in the 70s and then 80s there were laundry musks is what people would call them they were very um cleany type musks and and then they were overused um and I've, I've never really connected with that style however we had an opportunity at uh Alimar for to smell civet oh my god <laughs> oh my god i nearly died um but what was really interesting was I kept the, the little me at the blotter that we had this tiny, 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 tiny drop fraction of civet, real civet, which unfortunately it does come from animals. And um, I kept it in a notebook or something. And then I remember smelling it months later and going, oh, I love this, I get it. But I have decided alongside Laurent that we won't work with real animal product purely because that's not something that fits with what we believe, especially as we're pet owners, we, we wouldn't want anyone to to harm an animal to, to you know, have a fragrance ingredient. So most of the animalic masks, we use the aroma chemical the synthetic. I would quite happily come out with that because I don't want to use the naturals um, purely because of the animal uh, being harmed and the, and the farming of, of the product. But I do like them. Um, I'm trying to work with um, if I have this um, oud that is... Oh, he, said, um, he said the oud word, people. He I said, said the oud word. word. <laughs> <laughs> God, it's fine. He said the oud word. Do you know why? Because I, I, was, I fell in love with the concept of what they're doing. They're farming it. And I know the story of real oud is not something that you can farm and it has to come from, you know, the Botrytizer Aga tree and et cetera over many years. Um, but I love that the LMR are trying to look at sustainability and look at the future of fragrance materials from a farming perspective, as well as not devastating forests of, uh, you know, natural habitat to, to extract this. So I'm, I'm interested. We're starting the process Laurence there in, in France as we speak, which is why he's not here today. Um, but we'll see what they start to, to come back with. But um, wow. that may take a while, or it may never work. But the thing with me is I'm always fascinated by the things I don't quite understand, which is where patchouli came from, because as a raw note, I never really got it. I found it quite aggressive, um, maybe in that animalic style, but in its own very unique herbal way, um, as it's a grass. But through challenging ourselves and working with these amazing perfumers, I, I've got it, and now I love it. And so that's why we're going down the oud route, because I just want to have a play and see what happens. Well. Hopefully we'll have a chance to smell it soon. And from one very, very expensive ingredient to another, this isn't so much a question, it's a comment, but Woozy says an Impressions Oris would be amazing. You, you guys, are, I feel like you've got a recording equipment in my... No, they're box. just really good. They're just really good. They're, they're not really good. <laughs> so the Patchouli 2 in our collection, Patchouli de from Sophie Labe, has a huge ton of Oris in it, which is what transforms the patchouli into something very delicate and powdery, almost suede glove-like in our patchouli too. Um, so there's a lot of Oris in that. As a raw material and putting it just on a blotter on its own, I find Oris has a slightly carrot top mm -hmm. 
um, sometimes stinky sock feel to it. Like it, it's not, it's quite pungent. So it's not, only us would wear it on its own, I find. Um, the idea of iris, like Giacobetti's Iris for Inez, I love that, that slightly lighter, prettier iris fragrance, which I know is not technically iris, um, but, and it's so expensive. Like, oh my God, if I thought that rose was expensive. <laughs> the iris is like, no, there's no business after that. No, it's true. Now, there's one word that you said uh, earlier that actually is on my list of, of, of topics to, to address with you. There are so many, we, you know, we're, we're nearly done and there's still so much to talk about. But you said, you said Brexit. And I'm really fascinated. I mean, this is a whole topic in itself. But, you know, you're, you're UK based, you're a UK based brand. And yet you are dealing at the moment, I think, almost entirely with with a with a French based compounding house and, you know, French perfumers. Um, what's the sort of main effect of Brexit been on on everything? The main effect is the movement around Europe and into the UK. Um, it's been exceptionally hard post-Brexit to bring anything into the country. Getting it out is easy. We can ship, you know, things onto the continent, into, you know, but from France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, bringing things in, to the UK um, has been the biggest headache. And I don't know enough about politics to know why the borders at UK are stopping things coming in from outside of the UK, but um, that is what we're experiencing. So even getting new fragrance mods shipped over from Paris used to take three, four days on a like express. Um, now it's weeks just to, someone to send over a small bottle of a new mod. And you you work with lots of other brands. I think I'm right in saying that quite a few brands have just said, okay, we give up. We're not gonna be in the UK anymore because we just can't handle all this stuff. You know, it, it breaks my heart because even though I'm born in New Zealand and my ethnicity is Chinese, I've lived here for 20 years and it's where I found myself, I found my calling, fell in love with fragrance. So I am so warm hearted to my adopted home here in the UK. So uh, it, it is heartbreaking to hear that brands are leaving and people are giving up. I, I think we just have to wait and see with, it's so fresh, you know, like it's mm. seven months after the, the, the sort of drawbridge was pulled up as such. So we're still finding our feet. Um, I'm sticking it out for now. Um, you know, we do have logistics platforms moving into the US and Europe, like I said, so we can ship um, Austin's without extra customs and duties and things that are really weren't there when we were part of the European Union. So um, I'm trying to get around it and make it easier for customers and ourselves. Yeah. Um, but it's, I'm, I'm going to stay here for the meantime. You know. Brilliant. Let's try and squeeze in a few more questions, some sort of rapid fire ones, because they're coming in through. And this one is kind of tangentially related. This is from Christina, who says, uh, sorry, Kristen, or is it Christine, Christine A, Christina, is there a big difference to how a note or perfume is perceived in different regions of the world because of, for example, temperature, climate, culture, etc.? Oh, okay. Yes and no. Yes, that different parts of the world and different cultures perceive fragrances differently. Um, is it to do with temperature? I'm not sure. I think sometimes my concept of what I've experienced is that it is cultural and that everything that we've absorbed growing up. For example, I have a very, very strong affinity to rosewood because Chinese culture uses it in furniture. So it reminds me of comfort and my grandma and home. It's very medicinal. It's almost like a patchouli style feeling rose. Um, that's just the cultural differences there. Laurent with the baby powder, he hates Johnson & Johnson baby powder and heliotrope and all those sorts of powdery smells, but he loves orange blossom because of culturally what he grew up with. So uh, my take on it, I'm not a scientist, uh, I'm certainly not a, a sociologist and or anything like that, but I think it's to do with how we grew up. Thank you. And Woozy, are you exclusively using IFF perfumers? Yes, um, I love working with IFF. They've been so supportive. Judith Gross, who's the head of creativity at IFF, has g given us as a tiny brand all access. I mean, who gets to brand 
Rocking on Sophie Labe, Alexi Didier, Julian Raskine, Bruno Jovanovic. You know, I just think I feel so lucky. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's so much creative there. We use perfumers not just in their French offices, but in the US and New York. And, um, I love working with them. So, f for now, absolutely. And also, it gives us access to the LMR materials, which, again, I'm just, I can't stop banging on about how amazing quality they are. I thought you might say that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chris, for your time today, for 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 sharing your insights and your knowledge and your experience. Thank you to everybody for tuning in. And also, I should say, you've got on the little ticker tape for those of you watching live uh, information about how you can grab yourselves a complimentary Austin sample, but only if you're based in the UK. But if you're not based in the UK, fill in the form anyway. And Chris has promised to try and get something to you when he can. But please note, this link is valid only for one hour following the end of this broadcast and we're going to be ending the broadcast in a couple of minutes but one final question when the world uh, finally emerges from this pandemic situation from this covid situation and that will happen hopefully it will happen sooner rather than later do you think we're going to be relating to perfume in a different way in a in a post covid world totally totally we've seen this move what I've seen this trend towards comfort smell. So, you know, lots of skin scents. Um, I think it was naturally mimicking what was happening in the industry anyway with the growth of molecule, eccentric molecules and Santa 33 and very sort of you know, close to the skin human smells. Uh, but I think once we are let out, I think I would like to see, I predict, I would like to see the return of like va va boom fragrances, like going out slightly loud slightly obnoxious let's go back to poison <laughs> georgia <laughs> no, i'm kidding but certainly glam fragrances like i'm i can't wait to go to like a big event and wear my the patchouli one that we have which is like labdenum and it's rich and dense and it's a, a bit shouty which i love it's loud um it's like a night nightclub slash black tie type smell so i can't wait for that or you know i, I think we already saw it with uh, olivier's the Lyon for a Chanel, it's such a beautiful, big fragrance. You can't wear that at home privately. That has to be worn out. So I can't wait to see the return of slightly announced and powerful personality fragrances. Here, here, I'm always up for anybody wearing poison. Thank you very much indeed, Chris, and hopefully we'll be able to Thank get you, you back for for part two and for, and, and, and good luck with everything you're doing at Elstens. And um, thank you to all of you for tuning in. Stay tuned to social media for details of more interviews coming up, including this one that I should be revealing soon that hopefully will be next Wednesday. All the best, see you soon.